I would like to invite my speed solvers to the stage. You can sit. Uh, oh, Stella, your picture is blurry. I'm sorry. You can sit under your, your, your picture. I'm going to introduce all of you from here. No, that's my chair. <laughs> I'm going to introduce all of you from here and then uh, sit down with you and ask you some questions. Um, this is going to be great. We'll, we'll go for like 30 minutes and then I'll say bye. Uh, OK, great. Tyler Hinman is a software developer. He has won the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament seven times, including five in a row from 2005 to 2009, the first of which made him the youngest champion in tournament history at age 20. Stella, oh yeah, let's clap, let's clap. Stella Zawistowski is a puzzle maker and former incubator editor with me, uh, who works in advertising. She has been competing at crossword tournaments since 2001, with multiple top 10 finishes at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament and a handful of top fives. Her speed record for solving the New York Times Sunday Puzzle online is four minutes, 31 seconds. <laughs> Paolo Pasco writes puzzles for outlets like the New York Times, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, among others. Paolo has won a few iterations of the Bossword-based crossword tournament, Bosswords, and has placed second in Crossword Tournament from Your Couch, the largest crossword tournament in history, and in the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. His fastest solve for a New York Times crossword is 45 seconds. And Matthew Gritzmacher runs Daily Crossword Links, a daily newsletter and resource hub for the entire crossword community. Matt won Lollapuzzoola 15 in 2022 and has top 10 finishes in multiple other tournaments like the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. A paper solving specialist, Matt usually solves between 30 and 35 puzzles a day. Do any of you want to say anything about that? It's <laughs> a lot of paper. <laughs> I, 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 do you just like, print on both sides, I guess? I started doing that four days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Once upon a time, I solved in pen, and printing on both sides didn't work, and now I don't solve in pen, and I realized after five years of single-sided printing that I could do that. So I have a, one sort of like long winding question that I want all of you to share an answer on, and then we'll just see what happens. So feel free to like speak to only whatever part of this that you want, or answer a different question. Um, what is the relationship of speed solving to enjoying puzzles? Do you ever not speed solve on purpose so you can savor a puzzle? And what do you think about the fact that it takes you a tiny fraction of the time it, made the, it took the creator to solve something that someone made very carefully? And I will also add, all of these people are also crossword constructors. Tyler? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say most of the time I'm not speed solving like deliberately. Like if it's an American style crossword, the sort that I do at the tournament, like it can kind of just work out that way, just I've been doing it that way for so many years. But it's something like a like a cryptic or something with um with kind of more more novelty to it, I guess, then uh then I will I will kind of go slower. I don't I, I can't remember the last time like I speed solved a cryptic or something like that. But if it's just if it's like a you know, a Monday New York Times or something, um then it's just, I just kinda go at the pace that I'm that I'm used to. I don't really think of it as speed solving, honestly, at that point. Yeah, same. I, I do not try, I, I, I don't know any other way to solve an American crossword at this point. So I like slowing down to enjoy things, that is why I solve cryptic crosswords. That's why I got into cryptic crosswords. I, I highly recommend those to people who need a stronger drug. Um, <laughs> and to, with relation to the, like how I'm, whipping through something that it took someone a lot of care and time to construct. Yes. Um, and I sometimes feel bad that I, you know, for example, when I'm solving the USA Today, I often just do it downs only. I'm missing out on at least half of the clues that a constructor took the time to write. Sometimes I'll go back over and look at the clues after the fact just to see what was there. But I don't know, when you multiply the number of people in the world doing that puzzle and the number of minutes that that adds up to, I don't feel too guilty about it. It's, you know, you're, you're giving, you're, the ratio of how much work you put into it to how much enjoyment the world is getting out of it is still, like, it's a good ratio. 
Um, yeah, I like to think I still enjoy solving puzzles. I feel like if it started to suck, I would just hit the bricks and not solve again. Um, what? But I don't know. <laughs> like, if it becomes a grind where I'm just like doing it to get faster at it, like, you know, it's work. I don't want to do work. <laughs> But, yeah, I don't know. I think I still do appreciate it, even if I do end up solving it faster um, than I might normally would or if I might be in a different mode. Um, this happens when I'm solving on the computer or, like, a couple times in tournaments where I see a clue I really like. And not for anyone's benefit. Sometimes there's no one around me. But I just say, like, nice. I do that, too. <laughs> oh, sorry. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> I am always speed solving, 100% of the time. Um, I'm reminded, I was wondering if someone else would say it. Amy Rinaldo has a bit that she says of like when people put this question to her, and she says, I see the answer, I know the answer, I write the answer, right? You know, like you can't slow that process down. Um, I will push back gently on the idea that something can't be savored if it's happening quickly, um, because I do, that what Paula just talked about, I do appreciate good clues in that moment. Um, in terms of something that does get me out of that is I think puzzles that are deliberately limiting the context that you have, and cryptics are one way that that can happen um, and that not all letters are checked in the same way. And I think, Brooke, you've been a really, um, you've made a practice of trying to find new ways to present puzzles that don't give you the familiar amounts of context. Your, your Lollapazoola puzzle from the first year, the online Lala year, your Puzzmo puzzle from the other day, the, these puzzles found abortion, Rachel three or two, two puzzle. Um, those are the rare instances where it actually is, okay, this is a different enough experience for me that I'm not gonna treat this as puzzle five training, but puzzle five training is always in my mind as well, so. <laughs> Does someone wanna explain what puzzle five is? <laughs> yeah, puzzle five is, I think the reason I've never been on the podium at the Crossword Tournament. Um, it is the hardest puzzle at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. Um, it is harder than any puzzle you will encounter in life outside of the Crossword Tournament. Um, occasionally, there, you know, when you solve, if you solve Fireball, um, Peter Gordon's Indie Service, then um, you will uh, you will sometimes encounter puzzles that are as hard as Puzzle Five. But it's it it's it tends to be a theme that really requires a little more thinking. That's another thing, like crosswords have themes. I don't, I, 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 re, I rarely notice the themes in, in everyday solving, but yeah, puzzle five is just the hardest thing you're going to encounter as, as a puzzle solver. As a solver of Brooke's uh, experimental puzzles on her blog, I have to strongly yeah, disagree fair. with that. That's true. Those, that's fair. That's those fair. do exist, yeah. Do you want to share more about, yeah, <laughs> about what those um, are? <laughs> Sometimes when I get on Twitch and solve, to solve uh, uh, Brooke's uh, 27th of the month uh, puzzles uh, from her blog, and to say they were difficult would be an understatement. Um, the last one I tried before I dived into this computer game that I've been playing lately, um, I spent like an hour and a half on it. I had like a third of it done, and I gave up. Um, and that was that was that's the first time that's happened, but it has taken me like an hour and a half, two hours on the stream before, just because it's very difficult and a lot of it is frankly not in my wheelhouse, which is fine. But uh, even even the ones I do know are like eventually are extremely difficult clued in uh, such a way to be very kind of vague and uh, but oh, there's always there's always a few bangers in there though that I like kind of the, they have a great dawning moment when I finally figure out what they mean. So I'll keep doing them. <laughs> Including that one that I gave up on after 90 minutes. It's still sitting there. It's it's, it's waiting for me. Uh, I wanted to ask you all about the technical aspects of speed solving. Like, if you deliberately try to get faster, what do you do to try to get faster? Are there certain things that, when you tried to get faster, they didn't help you as much as you thought they would? Are there certain things that actually helped a lot but were unexpected? Whoever wants to start, but we'll, we'll hit everyone. I, I tried the lowercase e thing at some point, and it, it just doesn't take. I, I can't do it. It just bothers me viscerally. You want to you back up and explain the lowercase e thing? Yeah, you, you, you write the capital E, you got like kind of, you make like the L and then like the two additional strokes, but if you do like just that, it looks backwards to you, but you get it. Uh, it's, you know, theoretically faster, and I, 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 I just, I couldn't get there. I couldn't make myself do it. I mean, there's what, 17 E's in a puzzle? It's going to save you 
one point four seconds. Like <laughs> there are better yeah. ways to what? find time. <laughs> what difference could one point four seconds possibly make, right, Paolo? <laughs> Do you want to explain the jokes? That one, not really. <laughs> yeah. No, I could take this one. <laughs> Have you ever seen the longest 1.4 seconds of someone's life where in that amount of time someone loses like $3,000? Because if you want to see it, there's a great YouTube video I can recommend to you. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. Can you, can you explain it even more? <laughs> uh, so last year's puzzle tournament, uh, the very final puzzle, which everyone solves on a big board in front of a lot of people, uh, there was a single square that was the very last square I had to fill in. And for reasons that are beyond my control, I had to think like really hard about what that one square was. And in that time, uh, very good solver Dan Fair, nine-time champion, just kind of like swooped in and uh, got me by like 1.4 seconds, I've learned. I'm sorry I had to make Oh no, it's it. fine. <laughs> Talking through it helps me get past it. Uh, any, any technique thoughts you wanna share or do you, you're just vibes? Um, a lot of just vibes. I did end up doing a similar E thing. I ride my E's as a backwards three because I saw Eric do it on HBO's Real Sports with Brian Gumbel. Uh, the problem being that now I just do the backwards three E's when I write them just in general while I'm writing things. And outside of the context of a crossword, I do kind of look like an insane person. I just want to clarify that I have also lost to Dan on stage by like half a second. So I wasn't just taking the piss there. <laughs> uh, Stella, any technique? Um, yes, I have tried. I, I, I did train myself to do lowercase e's. He still keeps beating my ass. Um, and what else? Um, downs only solving. Um, that I, I do credit that with taking me from a top 50 solver to a top 10 solver because I, I have like an unusual trajectory in competitive solving. My first tournament, I was uh, 220th out of 330. So I think I, I was actually in the E division once. Um, so there is hope for everyone. Um, and yeah, I think like eventually I just started doing more puzzles, but I do think downs only trains you you to pattern to your pattern recognition skills in a way that helps later when you go to go back to solving with all of the clues. Do you want to really spell out what downs only solving is and what the E division is? Yes. Okay. So the E division is the lowest skill division at the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. It's for people who have not placed in the top two thirds. Uh, of their previous 65% um, of their uh, in their previous three tournaments, something like that. So um, I am now in the, in the A division, um, which is just no no restrictions. But um, but it took a while climbing up. Um, and then downs only solving is you don't look at the across clues in a puzzle. You just um, solve as many down clues as you can. Um, you may not get every single one, and then you have to figure out what goes in those missing squares based on the patterns of letters in the puzzle. Technique, what you got? I think a lot about technique. Um, I have not found down sol downs only solving to help me as much as I would hope, to be honest, um, which is, you know, maybe that'll change. Um, I think a lot about technique, particularly at this level of speed solving where the difference of I have not gotten this alert yet, so I check every time I hear someone do it. Um, you know, five seconds makes a, makes a big difference when you're talking about the amount of time that we're, we're, it takes to solve a puzzle at, at a speed solving rate. Um, the thing that I think about the most is, is grid navigation and getting a feel for different grid shapes and getting a feel for how the themes might be. There, there are some grid shapes that it does make more sense to flip all the way to the downs, and there are some that makes more sense to stay on the acrosses. Um, my, my big thing is minimizing eye movements and making sure that your eye movements are efficient. So knowing your clue list and having a good sense of what number you're around in the grid so that you're not jumping to 33 down instead of 43 down. Um, but there's this kind of like intuitive feel to, to grid shape and that can be affected by theme and, um, and into kind of what direction you want to move in. And I, I was talking to John Delphin, who had to leave um, before this, and I told him, you know, before I understood some of these things a bit better, I would find myself in a tournament puzzle finishing in the middle, and I'd say, oh, crap, like, that is not, <laughs> like, if you're finishing in the middle, you have messed up your journey through the grid um, from a speed-solving perspective. It means you didn't get the theme. It means that you kept hopping around. Um, 
And so I think about that type of thing a lot. I will say, and some, many people in the room have heard me say this, maybe not many, some, solve 10,000 puzzles first and then worry about speed solving technique because you'll get more out of the first 10,000 puzzles than you will anything that we talk about with downs only or anything like that. Uh, I, I'm happy to do this, but if someone wants to take it away, I just want to back up for a second, explain like what a crossword tournament looks like. Does one of you wanna one of you wanna take that, Tyler? Sure. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, we'll all journey to the uh, uh, Marriott uh, in beautiful Stamford, Connecticut, and we will, uh, and you know, tom tomorrow morning, starting at like eleven or whatever it is, uh, we'll uh, all go into the ballroom. Some of us in kind of the overflow area in the uh, in the basement, which they've had to start doing in recent years. And yeah, the judges will just pass out all the papers face down, and you'll put your kind of contestant sticker over it, which has your name and like your number kind of binary encoded uh, for the automatic scoring system. And then there's when you know they say go, you hear the sound of you know 800 papers turning over at once, and then everyone just uh, does it as as uh, fast as they can, accurately, of course. Uh, when you're done, you uh, raise your hand, um, and then judge collects it, writes down how many whole minutes you had left, and then they take it to the back and uh, grade it, which is uh, quite a painstaking process, as I know from other tournaments I've helped officiate. If you're not perfectly accurate about how much time is our mistakes worth? Eight, nine minutes. At the, New York, at the ACPT, it's eight, nine minutes. So one mistake is equivalent to solving eight or nine minutes slower, which yeah. for you all is like three puzzles. <laughs> but also three, three two puzzles, mistakes one. in the same puzzle is better than one mistake each in two different puzzles because the, the, the mistakes will be credited. The first mistake is in, in a puzzle is, is a killer, and then the next one after that, it's like, oh, whatever. There's a bunch of different tournaments, and not all of them follow the same scoring rules as the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. Uh, do you, any of you ever change your strategies when you're solving at a tournament with different rules? Or are you just like, I'm doing it as fast as possible, and I'm trying to get it all right, and that's all I got? Well, I mean, the, like, something like an online tournament like uh, Boss Words, where it's, it's to the second. It's like whenever you submit, so done, submit. Whereas the tournament, because it's whole minutes, if you, uh, you, know, you, you look at the clock and see there's you know, 14 minutes and 58 seconds left. First of all, you swear under your breath. Uh, and then you take that like 55 seconds-ish to just make sure you haven't done anything dumb because it's not going to affect your score. The only other tournament I've ever competed in, I think, is, is Lollapazoola. And the very wise Ken Stern just said to treat, treat it like, just don't give a shit. And um, it... I, I, I like the first year I went, or the first couple of years I went, that got me reasonably far, and then I won. So I guess not giving a shit is fine. Um, yeah, I think the meta changes a little bit for online tournaments too. That's where I did most of my like big speed solving, and yeah, I think it's a big mentality shift. I treat it as just like being on the computer, and like I love being on the computer. <laughs> I, I particularly like the Lala scoring system. Tell me if the scoring system has changed, but um, the points are not so much awarded based on your time, but based on your order. So depending on how you're feeling about the puzzle, if you're feeling quicker, there may be fewer people who sneak in ahead of you while you take time to check versus more in the middle of the pack. You might take a half a minute to check and 50 people might put their hands up. And I really liked that. that. That's the one that I'm most comfortable in. Um, I do not like the down to the second ones um, because I don't want to check, but I need to. And then it just becomes a stressful thing for me. So. Going in a totally different direction, uh, how does being a crossword constructor or having the ability to construct crosswords affect your ability to solve puzzles well and quickly? Or does it? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure it really did for me. Um, I had my first one in the New York Times in uh, 2000, but that was well before I could do a Friday puzzle consistently. So, it, I mean, may maybe it helped in ways I'm not quite aware of, but for me, they were kind of parallel tracks. By the way, there's been an earthquake. I don't know if everyone's aware of that. <laughs> just, just putting that out there, okay. Yeah, I don't know that it matters. I mean, there there are people at the in the D and E divisions who are very good constructors. There are people in the A division who never make puzzles. Um, and I don't know. I like I've 
I've made puzzles on and off. For, like there was a time in the two that, from like 2002 to 2010 where I made puzzles with a partner and I was never making the grid. It was always the clues. So I've only been making grids for five years. I don't think it's made me any better as a speed solver. I, I, it, th in theory, I could see how like it's as a grid maker, you if you would get good at better at recognizing like oh, there's only you know one thing that there there could be in this in this slot, even if you don't know what the clue refers to. But I I haven't found that that has changed anything. Yeah, I feel like there is like a little bit to be said about if you construct a lot, you end up thinking about every possible way you can clue Oreo. So when you see a clue for Oreo, you're like, this is probably a clue for Oreo. And then you write an Oreo. Um, but yeah, I feel like there's like a little bit of vibing out that could be said when you're filling in a grid. And you know, if you see an entry in the bottom row, and one answer possibility that you think of has a lot of E's and S's. Um, E's and S's are like really good for ending words, because a lot of words end with those letters. You could feel like more confident in that guess of like stress than of like nausea, because like you use a weird word ending letter. But sometimes they try to trick you. Ricky Cruz had a boss words puzzle with like a lot of X's in a really weird corner uh, as a trick, and I thought that was very mean. I loved I think, it, but it was me. I think last year Sam Azerski had like language suffix in his puzzle, and it was I S H ish, where a lot of times you see that E S E ease. And I think he was like, I did that on purpose to try to get everyone to write E S E. I think there was this might have been the the, the wordplay the documentary year. Um, what do you know about that? Eh, seen it once or twice. <laughs> Uh, but th I think I think it might have been puzzle one, like one across, part of QED. Everyone's like, oh, E-R-A-T, that's in crosswords all the time, boom. Nope, it was quad. Sorry. So uh, that was a curveball right off the does bat Does a there. Tyler or non-Tyler person want to explain Tyler's connection to the wordplay documentary? Um, I mean, that, that was filmed at the 2005 American Crossword Puzzle Tournament, and, um, the, and yeah, Tyler was in, that was the first year that you won, right? It um, was. Yeah. Sorry for the spoiler. <laughs> um, so I did solve that final puzzle also, but I was in the B division that year, so I got easier clues. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that puzzle is famous for things like uh, Zola-esque, which ha the, the one across was Zola-esque, um, the entry that tripped up Al Sanders, who otherwise seemed to be like ready ready to win that one. But also, it, it, it was one... like. I love Zola-esque because it, le it led to things like um, Trip Payne's uh, something different crossword a few years later that had Gorgonzola-esque <laughs> at one across. I, I actually gave him that. Fantastic. He, he's like, you mind if I use that as something different? I'm like, I'm never going to make one of those. You go right ahead. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> that, I loved it. OK, I'm outing myself as someone who actually hasn't watched wordplay, um, but. <laughs> My understanding is the documentary crew was like wanted to go see wordplay and totally unexpected to them it ended up being this like underdog story of this like 20 year old kid from Connecticut like winning oh, as the youngest champion ever. <laughs> right? Yeah, that, okay. yeah, it kind of kind of worked out that way. Um, yeah, the, the other the weird thing about that the, one of the interesting things was that one of the guys uh, Patrick Jordan who looked like he was going to be in the final but then made a mistake on Puzzle 7 and ended up not. They had not interviewed him for the documentary at all. So they're like, what do we do if he makes the final and he wins? Like, <laughs> like the guy who won is not one of our subjects? Like, what do we do? But I uh, also had that experience at the tournament because that was the first year that I cracked the top 10. And so, yeah, I was not interviewed. But And the first day that the filmmakers were there, I never spoke to any of them. And then the second day, they were all up in my grill. Like, the whole day, none of that footage makes the movie. There's a clip of you singing, though. There is a clip of me singing, but yeah, like all of the questions that I answered, none of it's there. Matt, did you want to say anything about the interface of construction and speed solving? You know, I was really thrilled that you called me a, a constructor because I'm very new in that. We've um, made a puzzle we've together. We've made a puzzle together, <laughs> I know, but I'm very new and junior compared to the others on, on stage. Um, you know, I was really, I'm really interested to hear them say um, to be as lukewarm on that as, as they were. Um, I feel like the piece that is most often brought up in this context is that sense of pattern recognition. If you're in, you know, compiler or in grid, you know, over and over again, you start to know what makes sense as a combination of, of pattern, right? Um, and I believe that's true. And I also have come to some level of that just as a solver. Um, I have an example, but I think it's in a puzzle that hasn't been released yet that I test solved, so I can't say it. But I had an entry, and I was like, 
I have no crossings. I can think of four or five different things. I'm going to put this thing down in the lower right that has letters that make sense for the part of the grid that it's in, right? And I think that's something that you can get to a certain degree as a solver anyway. So um, that's my contribution to that question. Uh, another total change of direction. Um, have any of you ever like done speed runs of video games in general that aren't you know this particular game? And do you see any connection between speed running in general and speed solving a crossword puzzle? Not a gamer. The only play, the only game I play is Zelda. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I've never really speed run. I, I mean, I play I play video games sometimes, but either they're not really things that lend themselves to uh, speed running. Uh, like the game I've been playing, Islands of Insight, is just like a t just a big open world with like a ton of puzzles in it. So you're just kind of running around. Like that's not really a speed thing. That's more likely going to be something that I try to get 100% on or at least close. I'm more likely to do that. I pretty much never succeed, but that's kind of always my aim. And if I play like a like a point and click like adventure game, I'll I'll go through every single branch of dialogue. I'll just I'll tr try to get everything out of it that I can. So it's almost. Not the opposite approach, but close. Oh yeah, I, I probably same here. I think the most hardcore gaming I've ever done has been like Guitar Hero, which is not a game that is conducive to doing really at any different pace than the normal pace of a song. <laughs> like at that point, it's mostly menu navigation, and I don't want to get into that. Just do the fire and the flames a bunch of times; it'll get you there. I think that point of menu navigation, though. Like speaks to it. I all I do is crosswords. I barely solve like marching bands. Like all I want to do is American crosswords. So there's that. You're gonna ask me to explain marching bands. It's a variety. <laughs> it's a variety format. There are a number of variety formats in which you still have entries that are checked in two ways in some way, but it's not the across and down of the grid. It might be a diagonal and across, or a, a ring and an across, and things like that. They, Wall Street Journal Saturdays, June Pog, outside the box. Um, who else? Subscribe to Daily Crossword Links. Subscribe to dailycrosswordlinks.com. <laughs> and Way yeah. better than a repository. Um, <laughs> to, to me, to think about it is, you know, my, my understanding of speedrunning, and many apologies if someone is going gonna, is gonna to yell at me for this, is that kind of question of menu navigation and timing and, and, and you know, getting your, it's, it's, it's a different skill to me than a sense of here's a contest of puzzling on an individual clue basis and on a how much information can you process and relay down onto the grid. Like, they're different enough skills to me that I don't have a personal appeal to like finding other ways to. Yeah, if there were like a different leisure activity that is more connected to the, the, the it, I, I know that like it's been noticed that a lot of crossword people are also involved in math or coding and a lot of crossword people are also musicians. Um, I, I, I suspect that the reason that I'm a very good sight reader in music is connected to the same thing that makes me good at crosswords. I don't know, like, do, do you guys do music? Or? I, I'm a singer. Right. Um, I was not trained in piano, and, you know, I think that piano players, I think that's the, personally, I think that's the top, like, data processing skill. Fair, that you can have. yep. I am not a skilled sight reader as a singer, but I, I think I agree with you, yeah. Um, do any, do any, or all of you want to share like your origin story? Like, did you decide to be like Stella? You decided you were gonna like be really good at this, but for others, did you? Was it a decision, or was it just like you happened to be fast, and then people started calling you a speed solver, and you were like, okay? I, I, I. It was a, it was a conscious decision for me. Um, I think I, I, I was, I, I heard about the uh, Crossword tournament through uh, Cruciverb, like an online forum for uh, Crossword constructors, which I was starting to get into at the time. And like, oh, that sounds like a lot of fun. And um, my family actually lived in England uh, at the time. So it was 2001, I think, uh, was the year I flew over from England uh, for the tournament. And I was horribly jet lagged the entire weekend. I got a total of like three hours of sleep. Um, I know for a fact I did not make the best first impression on a lot of people. Um, we were also 16. I was also 16. Um, but that, yeah, it was, you know, it was a lot of fun. Met a lot of people whose names I just heard. That was the year uh, Ellen won, which was really thrilling. Uh, yeah, and I, res I resolved to you know, get good, basically. I was, like, I was like 101st that year or something like that. Out of like only like, which is a w way better ranking now than it used to be, because now there's like 
you know, 800 people, 100 first is pretty awesome. Back then it was like 350, so, you know, not quite as uh, good percentile wise. Um, but I just decided, yeah, I really want to, you know, get up there. And then I heard that the youngest champion ever was like 23. And then, then okay, there's the goal. There it is. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my villain origin story. Why was it so thrilling that Ellen won? Why was it thrilling that Ellen won? Um, she, she was known as the Susan Lucci of crosswords, that she had made a ton of finals, but had never quite uh, broken through. And also, there uh, hadn't been a female champion since the first two tournaments. Uh, so it was re really great to see her uh, break through for uh, both of those reasons. And no woman has won since Ellen. Send me your vibes, please. <laughs> Do you want to share your origin story? Sure. I mean, I, so I was living in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut in 2001. So my first year and your first year were, were, were the same. And um, I heard about the tournament, read about it in a newspaper, and I thought like, oh, I'm going to come and do great. I thought I was going to do great. And yeah, 220th out of 330. I started just doing more puzzles, more puzzles, more puzzles. And that got me slowly up the ranks to, uh, to the B division. And then, yeah, downs only got me into the top 10. Um, yeah, for me, I, I don't know, it came, I think, at a point when I was also 16 years old. Um, I had been solving crosswords for a bit, and I felt like I was doing pretty good, but I'd never, you know, gone to a tournament because I was too, um, sorry, I'm looking for the word, uh, living in California. <laughs> um, um, but then I took a summer trip to New York, uh, Lollapazoola, the New York-based tournament that happens on a Saturday in August, uh, was also happening then. I enrolled in it, met a lot of people who are here right now. Um, Andy, I remember sitting at your table, very fast solver over there, insanely good. Um, but I remember winning the lower division of solvers, so like not top prize, but you know, it was something. And seeing both how much of a sport that solving could be, but also just, you know, how nice the people are around you of like, damn, this kid's kind of got the juice. It inspires you to keep going. Why wouldn't you want to do that? I told myself I was gonna do this quicker than I usually do, and then Paolo gave me all sorts of things that I wanna mention. Is, where's Natan? Can you wave your hand? Is he gone? He's out there in the back. Natan got me on Zoom like two years ago and asked me this question. I spoke for like 30 minutes, which was I, you uncomfortable. Speak I know I can't. <laughs> I, um, I had an awareness that I was faster solving the like what I now believe to be the daily commuter puzzle um, out of our local newspaper in high school um, with other guys before classes start. Um, and between the librarian there and my father, the New York Times kind of got this reputation in my head as something worth solving. And for many years, I only solved that one believing that it was the best, so why bother with anything else? And what did it for me was the year that the New York Times was running the anniversary puzzles with celebrity collabs. The Bill Clinton Vic Fleming puzzle had a note from Bill Shorts. It was like, Bill Clinton often solves things fast enough that would be competitive at tournaments. And I was like, well, let's see what that would be like, because I think I'm decently fast. And um, then it was like, wow, look at all these other puzzles. And if you solve faster, you can solve more puzzles. And then, like, that's been my motivation for, you know, 10 years now, is if you solve faster, you can solve more puzzles. Um, and my first tournament was at Lollapazoola. I, you know, had the very similar experience to, to Paolo there. And you made me laugh because you say it's like a sport. That year was the Olympics-themed year. And your puzzle, dealing with the way it did with sports, was like the puzzle that broke my brain for like indie world stuff because it was like this is something you can do in a grid and this is why I need to be solving more than the New York Times is because there are people out here doing things like this. It's very so nice that's here. that's very much my sorry. origin can story. Can you explain the theme of the puzzle? I can explain the theme of the puzzle. So for one, for someone who had only solved the New York Times up to that point, it was 13 by 19. Um, the themer is extended across the entire row. I think there were four rows of themers. And what was going on was that there were Olympic sports that were circled and moved out of base phrases. It's a very hard theme to explain. Yes, especially without uh, it in front of me. <laughs> yeah, so the title was Let the Games Begin. So it was the very first puzzle. Yeah. And then there would be bits of words that would not appear in the... Okay, so like the, the clue would be like person in mythology who had wings that melted. And it would be like, oh, Icarus, but there's only four letters. So you take out the AR from Icarus, you write in ICUs, because that's like a word, you move the AR to the beginning, and then you do that with all the other entries in the row, and then the bits that you move to the beginning spell out the word archery, which is a game that like begins, and that's the theme. And at this moment in time, I did not understand that themes were a thing. 
that was the first puzzle. They told me they were going to move it to first because of the title, and I was like, oh, okay. And then for a second, I was like, wait. But you're, you're describing like, a, oh my God, puzzles can be different than yes. what I'm solving. Yes. And like the New York Times and in the Daily Commuter, they can be sort of these like yeah. wild, magical things that are different shapes and are extraordinarily innovative themes that you might only give to people who love crosswords enough to want to congregate in like a basement and solve them. <laughs> a basement in a church. Um, and I had already at that point been solving kind of what I call the major dailies, but the newspaper puzzles. But I still, like, that was my first experience, not just of, oh, shape and indie vibes, but, like, of themes, <laughs> which are, like, an important thing in puzzles. And so um, that's really, and I've said this, that tournament and that puzzle in particular, like, just completely changed how I, like, think about all of this. I'm so glad I sat you two next to each other. <laughs> um, just, we're going to wrap up. Is there anything that you wanted to say to everyone about speed solving that you haven't said yet, or any questions you want to ask a specific other person here that you've always wondered? Uh, go for it, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, Tyler, what did you do between 2001 and 2005? Because <laughs> I didn't quite get that much better. I solved an extraordinary number of puzzles, I think is the only way to, like not nearly as many as I do now. Um, actually, within the last year, I've cut back considerably for various other reasons. Um, yeah, I mean, those like are how, my- Like how many? Hmm? Like, like go, go I, I don't, even, I don't even remember. I remember um, like downloading at least, you know, three or four like to do online. But moreover, um, you know, these were kind of, you know, the, my first few, uh, col like end of high school into college. Um, so I, you know, I got a lot of time that, you know, other guys would spend, you know, playing video games or talking to women. I would, uh, <laughs> I, 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 remember, I remember I would get uh, the Maura Jacobson uh, puzzle collections because she had a puzzle every year in the tournament. Like, okay, this will be good training. So I, I, I solved a lot of 21 by 21s speed solving, you know, on paper, which takes some getting used to. It's going to be a bit of an uh, endurance exercise. So getting used to that was... Uh, uh, was was a pretty good a pretty good training mechanism I think especially on a constructor who you know is there every year, uh, so yeah just just things like that just solving a ton of puzzles it's not like Scrabble where you have to like study word lists or anything like that it's just just a ton of solving. Any uh, things you want to share or questions you want to ask someone else here? I'm just interested in maybe not to make it another topic of conversation, but something I've been playing with recently is gravitating towards puzzles that are. Um, less edited or you know from newer constructors i've really been making a point of solving college newspaper puzzles both because i want to support those places but i find them to be more into this point that i talked about earlier the places where i have less context are places where i can push myself in different ways and so when they're full of topical things to the university of chicago or that um, and i'm wondering if that resonates with you guys of like finding ways to to force Challenge. Like to go outside your comfort zone, yeah. kind of. Yeah. Yeah, Brooks' experimental puzzles I mentioned definitely do that for me. Like, there's there are no puzzles that take me that long, at least of that style. So, yeah, that's something I really try to do, both to kind of go against go against the horrors that I can, and also humble me a little bit or a I, lot. I think test solving for both Puzmo and um, Little ABCX has helped a lot with that because um, where I guess a lack, uh, one of le m less my wheelhouse is like um, Gen Z stuff. I'm Gen X, so you know, I don't, I definitely solve a lot of puzzles where, for, for those two things where I'm like, oh man, I'm old. I need to learn what this is. And, and Stella and I are on the same uh, rotation for Puzmo <laughs> with our fact checking or our test solving. And so I know that I kind of do a vibe check there and see what you said and say, okay, I've learned the same things that she is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always good to remember there's like a gargantuan world of puzzles out there and people making puzzles. And I feel like it's, you know, you don't, you always benefit from seeing someone whose perspective on, you know, here's what a clue can be, here's what my frame of reference is, is like a little bit shifted from where your normal comfort zone is. I don't know, good for being a citizen of the world, too. Any, any, anything else? Are we good? Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing all of your thoughts on Speed Climbing. <laughs> oh, I guess maybe we could take maybe uh, some questions. Let's take like four minutes of questions and then, and then we'll hit it. Uh, can, I use this as, can I use this one as a question, Mike? Okay. Kate. 
I was curious, as people who are always um, a threat to win a CrossFit tournament, do you feel that the people who make puzzles for tournaments have an obligation to make those puzzles sort of catered to speed solving? For example, do you think that clues should be short and um, adhere to certain types of like style or like readability or be very traditional so that it facilitates being fast? I have feelings on that, not because I'm a speed solver, but because I have feelings of how much um, semantic processing a solver should be asked to do. <laughs> I think that, if, in a different way to answer that question, I think that tournaments do need to have at least one puzzle that is designed for speed solvers to separate, you know, some to have a little bit of a tiebreaker. But I, um, while I don't enjoy it, I can't say that there shouldn't be clue formats, like you say, in a tournament setting. That's um, my response to that. Ada? Uh, asking uh, the, I guess you've all constructed, so this is a uh, useless caveat. Um, but uh, for the constructing speed solvers, when you're constructing a grid, do you think in speed solver brain, oh, if I wrote this clue, I'd put in this, so I'm just gonna, like write a, like do you intentionally uh, do as many misdirects to essentially, um, I don't know, keep yourself at the top and make sure nobody's at your level? <laughs> um, like do you know what the, as a constructor, do you like know the mechanisms and then actively like not like uh, cater to them as like, uh, like a trick? Do you do tricks is what I'm asking. <laughs> I mean, it really depends on, you know, who am I making the puzzle for? Because if I'm making, you know, an easy puzzle, then I'm not going to do that. And if I, uh, you know, if I went sometimes for, yeah, when I'm making a puzzle for my blog, yes, I'm going to try and screw with your mind a little bit, yes. I hate cluing, so I'm not going to put that much thought into it, quite frankly. <laughs> Some people love it. I, I do not. <laughs> Zach, you want to? Ben, I'll come to you next. What are uh, some of your hobbies outside of puzzle solving entire, like, you know, obviously you said there's, you know, crosswords and other puzzle types you enjoy, but are there other hobbies you have outside of that? You mentioned singing, I think, as well, sort of more broadly. Um, I don't sing anymore, I've, I, I stop, I, I, but I was in a choir for a long time. Um, I do CrossFit, and I'm right now, the reason I'm not singing is I'm us using that time to learn Cantonese so that I can get closer to my family. Um, you know, my, like I'm, I'm half Chinese and, and I'm really feeling like, wow, I really wish I could understand more of what's being said at family gatherings. So I'm spending a lot of time learning Cantonese and it is hard. I've, uh, been getting into birds recently. Could be They're something. They're not real. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, like, I've, I've realized I'm not the type of person that gets up early enough to, like, look at the good birds. Um, <laughs> So it's troubling. I have a very flourishing uh, photo album on my phone of like all the pigeons I see, which have all been beautiful. But I don't know, outside of that, like CrossFit, sorry, cross stitching, the other cross <laughs> hobby. Uh, and a thriving letterbox at GP Pasco, should you feel so inclined. Do you use Merlin at all? I do, but again, it's like mostly, just, oh, it's a pigeon, nice. <laughs> I, know what they, I know what they look like. In theory, I bike, but um, I, well, no, it's, it's not the way that you think. I um, moved, moved to Hawaii last summer, and I live in a part of the island that is not really safe to bike. So right now, I just do crosswords and sing and take care of my dogs <laughs> and work. So. And, and for my part, I, you know, I host pub quiz sometimes. I guess that's kind of puzzle adjacent. Uh, big sports fan, watch a, lot of, uh, watch a lot of that, love watching hockey. Uh, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. Really, really a, not a lot that's not at least puzzle adjacent or, you know, work. Okay, last question, Ben. I'm just wondering what your, like, internal mindset is while speed solving. Like, how many clues you're keeping in your head at once and what you do if you don't 
understand something at first. Because from an outside perspective, solvers as fast as you, it seems like you just immediately know the answer to every clue. But I don't know what it's like uh, uh, from the inside. I feel like we could spend a lot of time talking about that at the bar. <laughs> Mine is kind of just like a long loop of like, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up, don't mess up. <laughs> and then sometimes I do, so like, what's the use? <laughs> When I don't know something, it's just you know sheer unadulterated panic, and then I move on. Yeah, I, I would say there's kind of a, a a comfort that comes only with not just having experience, but also like actually having in the moment having like on like my tenth puzzle of the day or something. That's kind of a feeling of a balance of a calculated risk at a moment to move on from a clue that you don't know, or move on from an area, um, or to try and push through it. Um, I would say that while it's not every clue. There are many, many clues that's like, yep, we just know it. You know, like that is true to an extent. So there's also, you know, speed solving and solving in a tournament, because I speed solve for sure. you know, without tournament pressure also. And it's like there I don't care as much as looking for mistakes or if I make one, I'm not gonna be you know, if I if I get the, you know, oh fiddlesticks on the New York Times, then I'm just like I usually just check. I'm like, I don't care. I it's it usually like seven times out of ten, it's just that I've typed in the wrong thing when I you know, and so I don't really count that as a blot on my solving ability. I uh, am remembering Lollapazoola is another tournament that happens in August. Sid and I edit for it. Sid, raise your hand. Um, I'm remembering the final that I wrote that was like kind of too hard. Um, <laughs> but uh, I. The final should be hard. This was the one that Matt won. And I remember watching you win it, and you just erased a whole section of the grid, and that rocked. Yeah, that was a skill that I had actively been working on in the run-up to that tournament, was sometimes I have something in a theme list and I leave it in and it's wrong for too long. I don't recognize that it's obviously wrong for too long. Um, and that was the northeast corner up there. And once I, once I cleared that out, everything fell pretty quickly in that puzzle. But it was, there's a skill to kind of realize when, oh, I've only got one thing in there, I've got two things in there, and I really should have more by now. And so it's time to rethink kind of what, how you've gotten to where you've gotten. All right, let's thank our speed solvers again. You don't need to do anything to the mics. You can take your water bottle. Um, wow, this was like, uh, I don't know how to progress the slide. Okay, this was like so much, so amazing. Uh, I, I dreamed of Crossword Con like six months ago, and now we're all here doing it, and I hope you've had an amazing time. Uh, thank you so much. To all the speakers and panelists and all my colleagues at Puzmo who have gone to a meeting a week for this. Um, and we would love if you would join us a nine minute walk away at the Empire Hotel at 44th, 44 West 63rd Street. And uh, thank you again. Enjoy your tote bag and clipboard. <laughs>